Ladies and gentlemen, what an absolute pleasure it is to be here to join you in Clues. I'm so sad it's not in person, but hey-ho, at least we can connect with this wonderful virtual world. So for 17 years, I served in the Royal Air Force and I flew this mighty aircraft, the Tornado GR4. I absolutely loved the job. I love the fact that it was challenging. Every single day that you go to work, you do something different. On one day, you're taking off in a jet that's clean. There's nothing hanging from it. It means that you can pull up to its maximum G-force, pulling up to seven times the force of gravity. At 7G, your body becomes the same weight as a Formula One car. You're pinned in your seat looking for your opponent because you're involved in dogfighting or air-to-air -air combat. One pilot pitting their skills against their opponent, technically trying to shoot the other one down. Now, as I am talking, there's two words that are going across every single mind in this auditorium. Yes, you're all thinking, Top Gun. Yes, I've got to be brutally honest, so did I. I got to my squadron. I thought it's time to change my name from Mandy. Maybe I'll go for the likes of Ice Maiden, but you don't get to choose your own call sign. And yes, there was a program on in America at the time called Sesame Street. I am six foot tall. And so my call sign became Big Bird. Hey ho, we cannot have everything. But this is really where my heart lay, taking off in a 35 million pound jet, flying off through the wonderful valleys of our Lake District. We head down into Wales and we look up onto the hills. We see somebody walking and we know that they are enjoying the peace and quiet of the countryside. And you think, aha. Uh -huh. They cannot hear or see me yet, but I can see them. Your hands migrate to your throttles and you get an overwhelming urge to suddenly ram them into full reheat. You're thrust back into your seat as you accelerate to just under 600 miles an hour. And at that critical stage of flying, one wrong move, it will all go horribly wrong. So what do you do? You go back to your basics. You remember what is truly important in life. You turn the jet on its side, I give a very casual and jaunty wave at the top of your canopy, as I did on this occasion, only to be caught on camera. No sooner had I landed, I was being summoned into my boss's office, who simply asked the question, Mandy, have you been waving at the sponsors again, also known as taxpayers? Uh, I said, I have, sir. And he said, well, I love this photo. Get it out there on the wall. Now, I'm often asked how I got into this. Um, well, we all need role models, and mine came in the form of my grandpa. He was a Second World War fighter pilot, and it was through his stories, through his guidance, that I started to experience this passion towards aviation. At the age of 14, I had my first opportunity to fly through an organisation called the Air Cadets. I joined, I flew, and I fell in love with it. Suddenly, I had a purpose and I had direction. I set my sights on becoming one of the very first female fast jet pilots. But I'll be honest, there was going to be quite a few obstacles in my way. Firstly, women weren't allowed to be pilots in the Air Force. And then secondly, when they did change the rules, I went on and I failed all of the aptitude tests, all the computer-based tests to be a pilot. I took them twice and I failed them twice. It was only through others believing in me and the fact the Air Force decided to take me on as a test case that I got my opportunity to pursue my dreams. I ended up getting all the way through to advanced flying training, flying this aircraft, the Hawk, based in Wales. Oh, it was an incredible aircraft to fly and I was loving it. And then I hit a stumbling block. I failed a flight. I was just three trips away from graduating, from gaining my RAF wings, my brevet, I failed a flight. I took it again, I failed it again. And suddenly I am in a spiral of loss of confidence. I'm put up for something called a chop ride. If you don't pass this flight, you will find yourself leaving the Air Force. Let me tell you about the trip I'd failed. I'd learned how to fly, maneuver at low level. I'd learned bombing, strafing, close formation. And we were putting all these skills together in something called tactical or battle. And it's when two aeroplanes head off at very low level. You're sticking with your wingman at all times because there's an enemy airborne trying to get behind you into your six o'clock to simulate shooting you down with a missile. 
and you have one blind spot when you're flying, it's directly behind you. You can't physically see into that space. So if you're an individual, you're guaranteed to fail. And as today is all about togetherness, then absolutely this was essential for us because without your trusted wingman, you would not have that set of eyes, being able to see 360 around you. Much like we all need trusted advisors, colleagues, friends to help us in our journeys. Now, I was pretty good at most of it apart from the turns. And as you're coming up to a turn, both aeroplanes need to pull up. You can't just turn to the left because now you're behind each other. You need to pull up, cross at a perpendicular angle. And when you roll out, you're in perfect formation, except for me, because that's what I was failing. Every night, I could feel the stress building. I would go up to my room. I would sit there, get my cardboard cockpit out and sit with it surrounding me on the bed. I'd flick switches, make radio calls and answer my own radio calls. And on this occasion, there was a knock on my door. It was one of my course mates. He was a uh, Rob. He'd been with me from the very start of flying training. And he said, Mandy, we have decided we are taking you out this evening. Now, my stress bucket was overflowing. I was not sleeping. I was not eating. I had skin rashes. But these were the days before we talked about mental health and awareness. And I felt I would be exposed. I would you know, show myself as being vulnerable, weak, if I told anybody. And so when the boys knocked on my door, they said, we're taking you out. I thought, no, that's not a good idea. He said, will you please trust me? Now, when he said that, I thought, what do I have to lose? Anyway, he took me down to the bike sheds. We got onto our bikes. We cycled to the other side of the airfield where there, waiting in the darkness were the remaining members of my course who had been very busy that day, making their bikes look like airplanes. Yes, they'd stuck wings on and we would now spend the next few hours cycling in battle formation, up and down, 30 degrees left, 60 degrees right. We did all the maneuvers I couldn't grasp in the air on the ground and suddenly it seemed so easy i'd had that tunnel vision fixated on a task in hand and i kept on doing it in exactly the same way and getting exactly the same results it's only when somebody else a great friend a colleague suggests a different way of thinking that cognitive diversity that suddenly it opens up your thinking I flew the trip the next day and at the end, I didn't know if I'd passed, but I opened my canopy. My instructor got out, he descended the steps and he very casually kissed the floor. I thought, that does not bode well. He is so relieved I've not killed him. He's celebrating the fact he is alive. And he looked at me and he said, what on earth was that? I said, oh, please don't say it. He said, Mandy, you have finally brought your mojo to work. He said, that was brilliant. What has happened? I told him the story about what the guys had done. And he said, wow. I said, I know it was really funny. He said, it's a bit more than funny. He said, you are in competition. You know, there are limited spaces on the front line to fly the fast jets that were around at the time. And he said, and actually one of your course mates may well have jeopardized his own career advancement to get you through. And when he said that, I have never felt so humbled. I've never felt so part of an incredibly highly performing team, a team that was willing to go the extra mile. There's a reason that team is spelt as it is. It's because together, everyone achieves more. And you might say, well, yes, but apart from in your case, Mandy, but when it was reported up through the chain of command, our squadron commander was blown away by the camaraderie. He has the ability to keep somebody on as an instructor, a creamy they're called, where they take the top layer off and they stay as instructors. And it meant my entire course graduated onto our aircraft types of choice. Mine was to fly this, the mighty Tornado GR4 on the front line. I was posted to two squadron, one of the oldest fixed wing squadrons in the Air Force. And within a matter of weeks, I found myself flying on operations over Iraq. We were defending the no-fly zone at the time over southern Iraq, and I was with the most incredible team of individuals. I say individuals, but when you come together and you have that harmony in your team, you're no longer forming, norming, you are truly performing. There are 63 trades within the Air Force, and we always talk about pilots, but we need every single one of those trades 
to be working as cogs in a big machine to actually even get an aircraft airborne. The trust that I had in my team was second to none. You can't just use the words regulation, compliance as things you have to do. They have to be within your heart and your soul. The culture has got to be how we do business around here when no one is looking. I would often go into work and be given a map that would look like this. The circles are surface to air missiles. The arrows are where the troops are on the move and the stars are not as one little girl asked me, are they to make your map look pretty? I said, no, these are huge guns that shoot up to 30,000 feet. And then we would design the route. I was doing predominantly reconnaissance. I was taking photos. On my last night out in theatre, I swept up my last target and I started to think about the fact I was going home. I had a great suntan. I was starting to relax when suddenly and without warning, my navigator shouted, Mandy, break right. I immediately responded. I slammed my throttles fully forward. I rolled quickly to 120 degrees. He basically started putting out flares. They burn at an incredibly hot intensity and they act as a decoy to a surface to a missile that had launched and locked onto the heat of my engines. It was a maneuver I had practiced hundreds of times before, but never for real. If I had got it wrong, I would not be here now. As we did the maneuver, the flares did take the surface to air missile and it missed us by about two miles. We then radioed through what had happened. We were part of a coalition of 80 aircraft that night and half of them were carrying weapons. The way it worked was that once an aggressive act was made towards any one of the coalition forces, we were entitled to prosecute an attack on a target. Our target was a radar station. We radioed through what had happened and quite frankly, chaos started to break out on the radio. It's at this point that you can feel that stress bucket beginning to build, but we're taught this fantastic saying, control the controllables. And if you can't, let it go. Now, it sounds quite simple, doesn't it? But so often we fill that stress bucket with all of these superfluous ancillary tasks that we can do nothing about. It's about actually maximizing where you focus your attention, giving priority to the tasks that you do have a sphere of influence over. After running through that in my mind, I fixated on the fact that we had a job to do. We had just been shot at our target, we had exactly enough fuel to get there, but not an ounce more. There was a, there was a um, an air, airborne tanker, a air to air refueling tanker airborne in Saudi Arabia. And so after consultation with my team, we decided to head to the tanker to get more fuel. As we got there, I realized it wasn't the British tanker I was expecting. It was an American tanker, one of which I was not cleared to tank from. After much consultation, I had a go. I wasn't successful. I had another go, I still wasn't successful. And I started to think, this is it. This is why perhaps you failed the tests in the first place. But with all that doubt going through my mind and after incredible encouragement, my team went back over the border. I, however, decided that I had a team that were way more qualified, experienced. And so, although I was leading my first ever combat mission that night, there were others that could do the job much better than myself. My boss and my number three went back into Iraq. They located the target and they destroyed it. I landed back at base feeling, if I'm brutally honest, like a failure. The first thing that happened was that my navigator said, Mandy, that was a really good call. Sometimes we try to push ourselves, but it's about working out where your limit is and where you sit within your team. I may have been leading it, and I certainly was, because when I ran the debrief, we ran through the funnel, exactly the questions we always ask. What happened? The facts. Why did it happen? The cause. But most importantly, how can we be better? After finishing the debrief, we heard that we were the only team to be successful that night. And I realised I had learned more about leadership in the form of being empowered to do my job. I felt accountable for my decision making, and I learned how to manage my stress. It was in fact a night that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Now, when I left, I wasn't quite ready to hang up my flying boots. And so I joined the volunteer reserve as an instructor pilot. I then would fly cadets from the air training corps, age 13 to 18. It's a lovely way for me to pass back a love of a career to the next generation. And I want to finish by telling you about a young girl that I flew with. Her name 
I discovered as she walked out to the jet. She had, in fact, her parachute on her back, her shoulders were bent over. She had quite an angry look on her face. I said, hi, my name is Flight Lieutenant Mandy Hickson. What's yours? She looked at me. She said, Emily. She had so much eye makeup on, I was slightly concerned that under G-force, maybe the weight of the mascara might prevent her from opening her eyes. But we started to taxi. I was putting her at ease. Have you ever flown before? No. Are you looking forward to it? I suppose. We got airborne and it was a perfect day. Pilot's paradise. We started to fly up, down, left and right. I gave her control and she was brilliant. She was a natural. We did some turns, 30 degrees initially. Most cadets go all up and down by two or 300 feet, but not Emily. She rolled in and she went round on the rails. I said, wow, let's see if you can do a 60 degree turn. I said, this is much harder. I said, what you need to do? At which point she held her hand between us and said, don't tell me. I read about that in a book somewhere. I thought, really? Because when you roll to 60 degrees, unless you add full power and pull back on the stick, your nose comes slicing through the horizon and you end up in a spiral descent to death. So I thought, crack on. So I gave her control. She adds the power. She pulled back and she did it perfectly. It was incredibly annoying. I cannot tell you. I said, let's do some aerobatics. I'm going to teach you how to do a loop. You lower the nose to 140 knots. You pull hard back on the stick, looking for the horizon. When you see it, you yell, yee-haw! Then you pull out the bottom in a 4G pull. I said, don't be scared at the bottom, Emily. We often hit turbulence. It means you're going through your own slipstream. It means you've hit perfection. So I demonstrated my loop and it was very smooth. There was no shaking. I gave her control. Oh, I have control, mum. She lowers the nose, pushes, pulls. We go through the horizon. She pulls out the bottom and the whole aeroplane shook violently. She looked across at me with suddenly the most radiant smile on her face. And that smile said to me, I'm better than you. And I thought, I'm going to crush you. I'm sorry, motivate you to be the very best version. No, I'll be honest, I wanted to break her just a little bit. So we did the entire flight and she was phenomenal. We landed the aircraft and we were taxiing it back in. And I said, do you know what, Emily? I've been flying now for 28 years. And in all that time, I've never flown with anyone with so much raw, natural talent as yourself. And do you know what she said? I bet you say that to everyone. It's like, oh, I said, I've never said it to anybody. You're fantastic. Is this something you might want to do? She looked at me and she got eye contact and she said, you're joking. She said, this is all I have ever wanted to do. I just never thought I was going to be very good at it. And I decided not to try because if you try really hard and then you fail, what can you blame it on? I said, Emily, you can't live your life like that. I said, how many opportunities are going to go whipping by unless you grab things with both hands? I said, how are you doing at school? And she went, that, I hate it. I said, that enables this. And you are brilliant. I saw her a year later. She walked past me in the corridor and she said, but you don't remember me. I thought, well, I better do because I was using her then in my speech. I said, Emily, isn't it? She said, ma'am, I'm so pleased you're here. I've got all my exams and I want to be a pilot just like you. I said at the beginning, we all need role models. Mine was my grandpa, but we can't be what we can't see. And it was at that point I decided to change my future fight path by working together, together with schools and businesses to share my story, to encourage other people to think big dreams.